Bones and All is a movie about the age-old saying, if you love someone, let them go. And if they don't return, find them and eat them. <laughs> but beyond the boldly honest message about how delicious people can be if you're just willing to give them a taste, Bones and All extends some worthwhile wisdom when it comes to our innermost self-hatred breeding flaws and how finding love and acceptance in another person can assist in our journey of finding love and acceptance within ourselves. So let's talk about Bones and All and how it gives a disgusting and at the same time beautiful new meaning to the phrase love bites. But first... We gotta do this! We have to do it! I'm 18 if you're wondering. Fuck you, Mission. Bones and All takes place in a not-so-nostalgia-laced 1980s and introduces us to Frank, a deadbeat dad who falls asleep while watching TV instead of feeding his daughter, Marin. So Marin sneaks away to her friend's sleepover and feeds herself. But Marin can't stomach the finger of blame, so Frank relocates with his daughter to Maryland, where he hopes Marin's unique finger licking will be considered good. But it's not, so he abandons her. Dad? But it's no trouble, because Frank leaves behind a tape for Marin so he can continue to disapprove of her disgusting taste palette from a safe distance. I wake up nights sick to death, hoping that you stop wanting things you shouldn't want, Marin. While on her way to Minnesota to track down her flesh muncher mother who skipped town long ago, Marin makes a stop in Ohio where she meets Soli, a friendly fellow flesh eater who wants to show Marin how to use her cool cannibal smell powers. You can smell lots of things if you know how. We just smell anyway. <laughs> so Sully takes Marin to his place and tells her there are more weirdos out there like them, as he makes her chicken and acts weird. A double, 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 double take. <laughs> but Marin isn't hungry for chicken. She's hungry for human. And lucky for her, Sully's saving a savory hunk of human for dessert. Upon seeing her nearly expired meal, however, Marin starts feeling a little vegan-y inside. But Sully hates vegans. Let me bone down on this. Whatever you and I got, it's gotta be fed. So he suggests Marin sleep it off before munch o'clock in the morning. After enjoying a hearty, nutrient-rich flesh fest, Sully shows Marin his collection of human hair from all the past victims he's eaten, because he likes being a father figure. But Marin thinks people who collect hair are almost as strange as people who collect stamps. So she jets out of there, leaving Sully feeling sad and empty, mostly from digestion. During a snatch and act cash sesh in Indiana, Marin catches a whiff of Lee, another flesh gobbler on the run who shares her annoyance with the obnoxiously drunk locals. You're out of control, buddy. But where most people see a drunk ass in a hat, Lee sees dinner, so he lures the ass hat away to get his gorge on. Upon returning from Gorgetown University, Lee gets spotted by Marin, who loves a shirtless man in red. I'm 18 if you're wondering. But Lee loves playing cool and distant, but Marin doesn't do distance. Or cool. I don't know whether to cry or scream or laugh or what. Don't scream. After deciding a couple young, flesh-positive parasites ought to stick together, Lee and Marin embark on a cross-country journey to find out what the hell's up with Marin's mom. But they hit the minor road bump of falling in love along the way, which leads to a lot of long, longing looks and cowhouse kisses. Where they live? The cows! While on a stop in Missouri, Lee and Marin cross paths with Jake and Brad, who also enjoy the benefits of a people-based diet. So they have a cozy campfire get-together where it's revealed that Brad doesn't actually need to eat human to survive like the rest of the group. He does it because having hobbies is important, which causes Marin to excuse herself because she hates posers, leaving Lee behind to put up with Jake's judgments. You remind me of every junkie I ever met. And his eerily spot-on Joker impressions. <laughs> <laughs> Deciding people who like the Joker a little too much are cringe, Lee and Marin sneak off in the middle of the night, leaving Jake behind like a dog chasing cars. Pressing on, the two hungry hungry humans stop off at a local carnival where Lee disguises himself as a snack. I'll see you in an hour. Yeah, you will. So he and Marin can snack. After experiencing some post-glut clarity, Marin expresses guilt over getting innocent bystanders stuck in her teeth. You should feel something. So we murder people, we steal their stuff, we move the f on. But Lee is quick to remind her it's not their fault they were born picky eaters. We gotta do this! We have to do it! After sleeping it off and continuing their investigation, they arrive at the local Minnesota mental hospital where Marin finally meets her mom, who would love to shake her daughter's hand if she didn't already eat hers. But it turns out Marin's mom is just another hypocrite who wants to kill all cannibals by eating all cannibals. So Marin leaves and demands Lee hate herself. But Lee refuses to hate herself. 
so she runs away to go hate herself by herself. Out on her own now, Marin has a chance to stumble across her old friend Soli, who's been following her. Soli offers Marin to live happily ever after in his creepy van, but Marin prefers to live sadly never anywhere near him instead, which triggers Soli to express his sincerest disappointment. You dumb cunt! And confess his most intimate secrets. I d off next to you. Then he skids off in his creepy van to show her what she's missing out on. F you. After far too many days spent alone with Daddy's Greatest Little Disappointment Mixtape Volume 1, Marin decides Lee wasn't such a bad blood bag after all, so she runs right back into the arms of old Skinny and Shirtless so they could get back to their Bonnie and Clyde thing. Later on, Lee shares his deepest, darkest secret with Marin. His father was an eater who one day tried to bite off more of Lee than he could chew, so Lee retaliated by chewing him out to death. I ate him right the fuck up. And it felt fucking great. After leveling up their relationship XP, the couple decides to try being people instead of eating people for a change. Let's be people. Yeah. Let's be them for a while. With Marin and Lee now indoctrinated into that Great Lake State suburban life, Marin realizes that a happy and healthy relationship usually means the end of the movie, so Soli arrives to show her why the credits haven't started rolling yet. Noticing his surprise party appearance has slightly startled his BFF, Soli reminds Marin that even though loneliness has turned him loony, he still means well. Luckily, Lee shows up just in time for the couple to turn the tables on Soli and open him up to new ways of living, without his intestines. But Soli dies because he can't hang, and as it turns out, neither can Lee on account of he was mortally wounded in the scuffle. But even though this means the end of a nice time for these two crazy carnivore kids, Lee sees no point in letting a good meal go to waste, so he insists Marin eat him bones and all, a request Marin is willing to fulfill by filling herself wholly and full of Lee. What did you do? I ate him right the fuck up. And it felt fucking great. I felt the high as a motherfucker. On one hand, Bones and All is an adaptation of a young adult novel, one I didn't read, so DON'T so BACK OFF! Sharing space with the likes of other genre-infused teen romance stories like The Hunger Games or Twilight. Only here, the monsters aren't so pretty. Actually, yeah, yeah they are. But the monstrous acts we watch them commit aren't quite so much. The movie utilizes a potent coating of visceral, gruesome horror to accentuate its larger themes. Something not often found in your typical PG-13 YA adaptation. But the highly durable gorilla glue stick that keeps bones and all from collapsing into a very what the f am I watching game of cannibal baseball is director Luca Guadagnino, I think whose previous and particularly relevant directorial efforts are his remake of Suspiria, which, yeah, there's a lot to unpack there, let's save that for another video. And Call Me By Your Name. Call Me By Your Name shares some very similar DNA with Bones and All, most notably because it explores a very different kind of cannibalism. Sorry. Much like Bones, Call Me takes place in the 1980s, explores two lonely souls falling in love, and features the funkalicious dance moves of Timothy Chalamet. But its most notable connective tissue is that, at its heart, it's about two people having to hide who and what they truly are to conform to the societal norms of their time, and ultimately finding a contentment in just existing as they are together. The movie pushes this misunderstood outsider concept even further by having its story unfold rather close to ethically questionable boundaries, the lines of which vary from person to person and culture to culture when it comes to the age difference between 17-year-old Elio and 24-year-old Oliver. Yet by painting a picture of this particular scenario that isn't a case of predator and prey, the movie challenges us to separate ourselves from preconceived judgments and simply witness with presence a love between two people within a fleeting time and space. With Bones and All, our ethical boundaries are put much further to the test. This time we're hurled into definitely morally wrong territory as we're introduced to a particular set of people on the outskirts of society who kill and eat innocent people on the regular. Still, the movie challenges us by spotlighting these characters under a deeply relatable humanistic lens, appealing to our empathy in a way that gradually separates us from our moral considerations of right and wrong making us feel and resonate with the very real pain and loneliness of its two central characters. The movie first and foremost explores the notion of empathizing with even the most deplorable of human beings by not shying away from showcasing, in all its grotesque horror, the unhinged violence of the eaters. When Marin mangles her friend's finger, 
The absolute revulsion it inspires makes us understand why Marin's deranged hunger is deemed taboo. However, when Marin's father abandons her as a result of this incident, our judgment is traded in for compassion. And it's a compassion that stems from observing a situation that is anything but morally straightforward. Frank leaving his daughter behind may initially seem cold-hearted, but it becomes quickly apparent that it's done out of a very complicated love for his daughter. I can't help you anymore. I, I can't do anything else either. Frank's love for Marin forced him to become a criminal, to cover his daughter's tracks because he couldn't find it in himself to turn her in for being what she naturally is. But the weight of guilt is ultimately too much for him to bear, until the most loving thing he can do is leave her to her own devices. Love her from a distance because loving her up close is a desecration of his morality. Thus, the movie springs into a journey of self-discovery for Marin, of going out into the world as an adult and searching for a way to contend with the darkness that is bound to her. Instead of taking on a traditional cause and effect plot structure, the story moves around more freely from one encounter to the next as Marin grapples with the inner monster she can't escape, but also can't live with. The consistent emphasis on the seemingly endless, untapped rural landscapes throughout is reflective of the unexplored beauty and turmoil of these societal outcasts, of these people that have every reason to be feared and avoided, but are still human nonetheless. Soli becomes the first reflection Marin is forced to see herself in, someone with the same terrible defect as her, subject to a mind-depressing loneliness that's sprinkled a little cuckoo into his coconut over time. A double, double, a double, a double take. As he explains to Marin that her hunger for flesh will only grow stronger and more ravenous with age. You're gonna need it more and more and more, and you won't always be able to hold yourself back. She's confronted with a horrifying realization that instead of learning to control what she hates about herself over time, it'll only grow stronger and more unmanageable. And when we're young and coming of age, discovering for the first time the raw power and influence of our worst personal attributes, or at least what we perceive to be our worst attributes, or what society is deemed to be our worst attributes, can breed a fierce whirlwind of self-loathing. The movie makes it easy to empathize with these monsters because it makes it easy to see ourselves in these monsters. While Bones isn't shy when it comes to getting real about our inner emo selves and reveling in the pain and loneliness of all that we are, Life is pain. Life is only pain. It's also not shy about providing us with the corny but true antidote, which is, of course, finding your Timothy Chalamet, less commonly referred to as finding love. Soli is an example of someone who is tragically unable to find love, and as a result, loses himself to the insanity of loneliness. I just wanted to be with someone who understood. It's never really made clear if his want for love and companionship with Marin is based in sexual desire or that of a father-daughter dynamic. Regardless, what we're meant to gain from his bleak unraveling is that these ill-fated outcasts aren't always meant to have their need for love satisfied. That sometimes isolation can lead to nothing but a hopeless end. Which, in retrospect, works to make us see Marin and Lee's short-lived connection as all the more rare and profound. As their relationship begins to blossom in the middle of the movie, there's a feeling of a great weight being lifted, of a love entering into the lives of these two people that didn't even know love was possible for them. The scenery of the great big world they're traveling through brimming with power and beauty, the sun shining through, and as a serene acoustic melody guides the moment, a peaceful tranquility takes hold. While we observe these two people just being as they are for what seems like the first time in their lives, as delightful as this section is for these two characters though, there's still a lingering, internalized self-loathing that comes to shake up the stillness of what they share. Both Lee and Marin experience an underlining guilt and disgust for their innate hunger. It's a core essence that binds them. But it's the opposing reactions to their cruel actions that creates the friction. Lee looks for an escape from his self-hatred in Marin. As MVP Joker impersonator Jake puts it, Maybe I will sit. You. Lee sees a way to divert his focus from the pain of who he is and what he does by going all in with Marin. He thinks if he can control her feelings about herself, if he can get her to accept what she is deep down, then he too can find acceptance within himself. 
like a mirror he could force to show what he wants to see. We don't have many options, Marin. Either you eat, you off yourself, or you lock yourself up like her in there. But Marin is unwilling to avoid the pain. Why can't you let me have this? She feels unworthy of experiencing love and believes, like her mom, punishment by way of self-isolation is all she deserves. Interestingly enough, both characters are guided by a shame made all the worse by their parents' reaction to them. Marin's dad tried his best to accommodate his daughter, but he could never truly accept what she is, hoping instead she'd one day find a way to rid herself of the depravity inside of her. And when Marin seeks out approval from her mother, she only receives further confirmation of an innate ugliness that has no place in the world. The world of love wants no monsters in it, so let me help you out of it. Meanwhile, Lee's father went rabid and tried to eat him and his family, and in retaliation, Lee ate his father to death, as one does, proving to himself that he's no different than his dad, that he too feels satisfaction in indulging the monster within, leading to a deep-seated guilt he refuses to outwardly acknowledge. What happened to your dad? You never say anything. Nothing good. Both Marin and Lee fear they're the very same monsters their parents are conveying a very real psychology to these characters with a very unreal appetite. Towards the end, Marin comes to see that beneath his tough exterior, Lee carries the same weight of self-loathing that she does. While she ran off into literal isolation, believing she was the only one in the relationship that felt disgrace for her appetite, Lee was living in a mental prison of guilt all along, only projecting an image of assuredness. And it's when Lee is finally comfortable enough to unmask himself to Marin, to show her the pain of being what he is and the past that shaped him, that the two misfits are finally able to see and accept each other as they are, flaws and all. Bones sports a consistent motif of snapshots shown of characters as they are in a specific time and place, juxtaposed against where they are within the present frames of the movie. As their relationship is just beginning to take off, Marin finds a box of Lee's childhood pictures, capturing a time and place of innocence and purity, removed from the burden of misfortune that defines his later life. Or at least it seems innocence and purity is all that defines these photos, because momentary snapshots can be deceiving, or only tell a small sliver of the story as shown with the carnival employee that Lee and Marin manipulate and kill so they can feed. In the brief frame of time we get to observe before his death, we see him only as a bully to a little kid Come on. who seeks out quick personal pleasure by getting his rocks off with customers. Lucky, lucky. But after she and Lee gulp the horn dog down, Marin finds and confirms through photographs in the man's car that he has a family, that there was more complexity to this person than initial appearances suggested. Even the tape recording Marin's dad leaves her with is just a perception of Marin captured at a specific time. She carries around these sound bites throughout the movie as an opinion that represents a definitive idea of herself, internalizing the good, bad, and overarching disappointment communicated in his words, allowing it to shape her outlook of who she is. When Marin destroys the tape before reacquainting with Lee, she's unraveling a perception of herself that was never really her own, instead choosing to embrace what feels right to her at this specific moment, guiding the direction of her life with her own thoughts and feelings rather than her father's. Through photographs and snapshots, the movie communicates the ongoing cycle of change, that a person's entire life isn't defined by one captured moment in time. It's only an expression of how something looks or feels in that brief period and from that specific vantage point. During the climax, as Marin, Lee, and Soli struggle violently for survival, the camera cuts away to the exterior of the apartment where the serene stillness of the outside contrasts the horror taking place inside. Capturing a certain angle of something can convey either an outward beauty or an internal darkness. It all depends how we look at it. The movie itself is a capturing of a short handful of months in Lee and Marin's lives where they get to experience love, a momentary freedom from the loneliness they thought defined them, before that flash of time passes and their connection is severed. It's all to convey that moments, no matter how joyful or dreadful they may feel, are fleeting and can only be experienced for so long before the next moment, whatever it may have in store, comes to replace it. 
and there can be an advantage in choosing to see the larger picture of something and simply appreciating it for what it is. Like the shots capturing the natural state of the surrounding world throughout, we observe Marin and Lee in their natural state, free from moral consideration or projection of opinion or ideology. We're just with them and all the good, bad, and in-between that makes up the portrait of their relationship. As their time together runs its course in the end and Lee slowly fades, the song accompanying the scene hits on the fleeting nature of what they shared. For a minute, just a minute, we made it feel like home. As Lee tells Marin to eat him, bones and all. And despite this being a deeply disturbed note to end on in a vacuum, in the context of these deeply disturbed characters, it signals growth. Earlier on in the movie, Jake alludes to the idea of eating someone, bones and all, as a transcendent act, like a leveling up of your character. There's before bones and all, and then there's after. At the time, Lee and Marin are slightly intrigued, but ultimately put off by the thought. But in their final moments, having now completed the journey of overcoming their self-hatred together, Lee's request signals an acceptance of what is a fundamental part of their nature, that while the outside world may see their hunger as a defect, they now understand it as an essential piece of themselves, a shared essence that brought them together. Lee transfers himself entirely over to Marin in celebration of what she is. And though what they had is over, she'll still carry a part of Lee with her, and not just in her stomach. It's not revealed to us where Marin's journey takes her after this window of time because the movie itself acts as only a snapshot of what she and Lee shared. But just before the credits roll, one final image of the couple is shown on screen, an image from the moment all their walls were brought down and they could fully embrace love together. Extending a catharsis and knowing that though this short but beautiful time is now past, there was a brief period when it got to be lived in and felt to its fullest by these two lost and lonely souls. I am so sorry for what your daddy passed down to you. But I wanted a child, the greatest gift of my life. I'm visiting my mother tomorrow.